Hi, I'm Andrea Marley, and I want to be a sign of the kingdom. It was, I think it was about 12 or 13 years ago that um, I first heard about Kids Club, and it was Linda Tatsuno and Dory Fast who were starting it up, and I was just like blown away. I'm like, we can go on campus, public schools, with kids after school and tell them about Jesus, and I just thought, wow. So I was really excited to be a part of that. So what we do at Kids Club is, you know, we welcome any kids who want to come. Usually it's between like 30 and 60 kids maybe that, that come and um, grades one through six. And we sing songs, they learn a lesson about Jesus, we do crafts, we hang out with them. We're just given an opportunity to love on the kids and it's just awesome. An important thing for kids to know to learn about God is how much he loves them and that he loves them unconditionally. Um, we've run into a lot of situations with uh, kids in the, uh, at the schools that we've been to where maybe their home situation isn't the best and they don't receive that kind of love. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about God is the unconditional love and so I think hopefully we're able to to share that with them get that across to them with Kids Club. The thing I love about working with kids is that they're just hilarious they're so funny you never know what's going to come out of their mouths and and um, it's just fun it's just fun to work with them. Right. So the respite event um, invites kids with special needs and their siblings and um, we take them for about four hours and um, let the parents go and do whatever they want to do and just have a break. And um, it has been so rewarding. Um, it brings tears to my eyes when I, when I see the parents come to pick up the kids at the end of the time and they're just so like, you know, relaxed and just so grateful to have had the time. And, and I think just knowing that um, there's adults here that care uh, care enough to take time and, and spend time with their kids. And yes, I hope with, with the respite event, we can be like a sign of the kingdom for the parents and for the kids and for anyone else kind of watching is, um, you know, Jesus cares for everyone. Amen. Well, good morning. Great to be together again, church. Um, great to hear uh, Andrea Stroy. I had a great time sitting with her and uh, just interviewing her about her own life and faith and ways in which she seeks to be what we call a sign of the kingdom. We'll be having more and more of these testimonies in the, in the coming weeks. It's part of our study of, of, of this central message of Jesus uh, called the kingdom of God, uh, the thing that he talks most about. And we're seeking to spend these 14 weeks studying together, trying to understand what is that? What does that mean? What does it mean for our lives? What does it mean for our world? And so in her sharing, it's just an example of someone who's among us uh, who's seeking to, to experience that life-changing love, the transformative power of Christ in their lives, and then to bear fruit uh, in the world. And we have a symbol for each week, and you can kind of, if you're in the room, you can see them uh, left to right there. And just a super fast recap, the U-turn was week one in which we repent and we turn around our lives because of the kingdom. The upside-down castle represents the upside on ways of the kingdom, a king who would become a servant and lift up the lowly. The heart says God wants our heart, not just our external ritualistic obedience, but deep heart transformation. The crown is our yearning for the coming of the kingdom, for God's will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Uh, last week, we did the inbreaking kingdom. This is, you see the rays of light breaking through the window. That's the power of the kingdom, the power of, uh, of, of God, the power of the realm of God breaking in to even the here or now. 
Our scripture last week, Jesus uh, healed a man who was blind and unable to talk and also possessed by a demon. Jesus was accused of witchcraft, of working by the power of Satan, and he explained to us uh, in a one-verse parable what he's doing. He talked about the robber that's, that ties up the strong man and plunders his house. And in that way, he uses a surprising analogy of being a robber. And essentially what he's telling us there is the devil has stolen what is rightfully God's. The devil is like that person who's taken control, but Jesus takes it back and he fights for us. That's kind of what we looked at last week in a really surprising analogy that Jesus uh, gives us. And then we're at the scripture today, which we heard read earlier, the parable of the sower. And that's what we're going to be studying today. Before we dive directly into unpacking Jesus' parable, I want to tell you a parable of my own. I call it the parable of my mom's Christmas presents. You ready for this? All right. My mom... Uh, gives really good Christmas presents. She, she thinks about it all during the year uh, in a way that just puts me to shame. I mean, I'm, I am the, oh my gosh, it's just a, a week before and I forgot about some people, right? But my mom is not like that. She, months ahead of time, she begins her reconnaissance work. Okay, she begins asking for requests. She begins trying to figure out what are people's hobbies and interests this year? How can, and so she's buying presents for, you know, there's myself and my three siblings, for our spouses, for our kids. There's 13 grandkids. So I mean, there's like over 20 people that she's shopping for just for the Robbins family Christmas. And uh, she gives good gifts uh, every year, generous gifts. Uh, but over the years, I have found that various gifts produce different responses in me. So I'm going to walk you through a few of my mother's Christmas presents, and in particular, the response they have in me. Okay, one of the funniest and most surprising gifts that I got was one year, every once in a while, she finds something that she's so excited about that she gets it for myself and all of my siblings, right? Right? The same item, it's in the same package, the same wrapping paper. She goes, hey, these ones, you guys all open at the same time. You guys ever, you guys know this experience? Okay. And so there's one of these uh, particular ones in which uh, we were opening it at, uh, at the same time. And we opened it up and we all had the same reaction when we opened it up and we're like, what? What? what, what Mom, what is this? Right, And my mom, uh, full of excitement, I'm sure she's seen the commercial for this item, she says, it's a personal fajita plate. It's an all-in-one fajita system. You can cook on it, and then you serve it. Only one dish gets dirty, and look at how cute. There's a little uh, pepper handle of the tortilla warmer. Right, And she had this vision in her mind uh, of us all just at home, just loving making ourselves fajitas and serving on our own personal plate. Okay, so, so, so how did I receive it? I said, wow, wow, wow like, like thank, thanks, mom. Okay, but then what did I do? You know what I, you know what I did? I, I, I gotta confess, I, uh, I never opened the box. I, I, I didn't. I, I, just, I just, this particular one, I didn't get the vision, I didn't get the vision of it. I don't know why, as I'm talking about it now, I, I kind of wish I had, I mean, this could, this could be cool. I kind of get it now. But back then, I was like, I don't get it. And uh, I never opened the box, right? I, I, I think I probably gave it away like a pink elephant exchange or something. But Okay, but my sister did worse. My little sister, Elizabeth, did much worse. She did the ultimate insult to a Christmas present. You know what she did? She never took it home. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, you can understand. She left it at my parents' house where it was put up on a high shelf in the pantry where it remained for 10 years. There was a fajita plate, unopened box, on the shelf for 10 years, right? Until they probably gave it away at a pink elephant exchange. But, but that's the way that myself um, and my siblings received the fajita plate. It just, we, just, it just, we just didn't get it. It, it, it. it just bounced right off of us, okay? A different year, 
When I was 19, I had li- I'd been in college for a, a little over a year. It was my sophomore year. And, and all the roommates I lived with were musicians. They all played guitar. They were just incredible musicians. And I, I started getting inspired. To, Maybe I want to learn guitar. And I shared this with my mom. She, she learned that I was interested in, 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 in learning to play guitar. And so she bought me a guitar for Christmas. And... Uh, I, uh, I was so pumped. I was so excited. I, I, I took it, and uh, I took it to, to my roommates that were good musicians, and had them, you know, teach me. If we could turn this on, I'll give a little demo. You guys want a demo? <laughs> yeah. So I had this vision. I don't have my pick. Oh, well. So I learned some basic, okay, some basic chords, the D, the A, E, different Gs. Okay, I learned... I thought you guys would applaud. You're not impressed? Okay, thank you. I learned some different strum pattern. So, you know, I learned a few things. Isn't that cool? Okay. I, I, I peaked. Uh, I, I, took a, I took a class. Uh, I, um, I, uh, my roommates taught me some things. I peaked at, at, at this one time where I could... I could, uh, at one point, I could finger pick Tears in Heaven, okay? That was like by far the most impressive thing that I could do. Um, And I had visions at the time. One day, I'm gonna get to be a cool worship leader like these guys, right? I'm gonna be one of those people up on a stage. I'm either gonna be a rock star or like a worship pastor, and that's kind of the same thing, right? Right? I'm like, that's, I'm like, this is, is, I'm going to make it, right? I'm going to be like my, 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 my friend, I'm going to be a musician, and I'm going to do that. And, um, uh, but uh, I even practiced how I was going to hold my guitar, you know, like, I was gonna, you know. Okay, but um, it never happened for me. I had to become a preacher instead. Dude. So um, what happened is I hit some adversity, okay, in my guitar playing. Uh, that same year, uh, maybe, must be, I don't know, maybe, maybe nine months in or something, um, I was playing flag football, uh, and I was going for a flag, and I broke this finger. If you ever see this finger, it's, it's, it's nasty, okay? Uh, I broke this finger into three, this bone into three pieces, and it pulled uh, the tendon back, pulled back into my hand. And, ew, yeah, thanks. It's my, it's, my, it's my body, okay? Don't call me gross. Okay, no, I... I had reconstructive surgery. They put a pin back in it, and I was in a cast. Uh, and I, you know, you can't, you can't play with a club, right? So I, I just, I had to stop. My momentum was stopped. Later, I misunderstood how fragile my hand was, and I was doing Taibo with an apartment of girls next door, and I rebroke my hand. This time, into five pieces, tendon back into my hand. They, they, the hospital kept calling me the Taibo man, and they, they did another reconstructive surgery. This time, pinning it all back together. Uh, the end result is I don't. I actually can't move this knuckle, uh, and I had. A, I ended up with a lot of months of my my right hand, you know, totally in a in a cast, and and it just kind of broke my my momentum. Um, now a lot of people overcome adversity like that, right? A lot of people uh, overcome adversity. They they get back on the horse. They they they, they learn and they, and they and they move past it. I didn't. I didn't. It broke my momentum. And I've picked it up now and then since, but, but I never have had that same momentum, that hunger. I, I, every, almost everything I learned, I learned before I broke my finger. And now it's like it sits and it, it, it just kind of collects dust in my office. It sits next to my prayer chair because I'm always hoping someday I'm gonna pick it up again. you know. But uh, every once in a while I play it, but I almost exclusively play things that I learned when, when, I, was, when I was 19. Uh, that's my relationship, um, that's my relationship with uh, the gift of the guitar. That's the story. Another year, my mom gave me uh, a weight set, okay? And, I, and I'd asked for this. I told her, Mom, I want to get shredded, right? <laughs> Give me a weight set. Okay, now, now, actually, this is kind of what I was meaning, but she actually went all out. She got me this weight set that took up half my garage. Remember that, Joy? Right? Remember, I wanted, I wanted to put it in our living room. And you're like, no way, that's going in the garage. Um, and uh, so I took up like half my garage, this big weight set. And I, was tell, I, was t- I told my mom, I'm like, Mom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ripped this year. Next year at Christmas, you're not even going to recognize me. 
right? And I just had visions of just how buff I'm gonna get with this weight set. So, what do you guys think? <laughs> did I, uh, thank you, thank you. Like, uh, <laughs> did, I, did I become a bodybuilder? You're supposed to say, yes, pastor, you look like, absolutely, you look like you lift. But I, you might be surprised to learn this, but this is all natural, actually. Uh, I'm not actually a bodybuilder. I don't actually regularly lift weights. Uh, surprising, I know, right? But, but here's, what happened with, here's what happened with my weight set is uh, life happened, right? I had the intention that I was gonna do this, okay, but, but then what happened is I had a job and it, and it took a lot of time and energy and then I would come home. I have a wife and I have three kids and I have a dog and when I give attention to all of those and, and, and that takes time and, and at some point the kids are in bed and, and, and then I'm tired, right? And, and there's a football game on and there's makings for nachos in the refrigerator, and, uh, and then when I, when I do come to the weights, they're, they're heavy, <laughs> right? And, and I get tired, right? And, and so, so the weight set is something that I just always had this intention to do. But I just almost never got around to. I just had so many other things taking my time and attention. So I'm just reviewing this parable so far. Um, the fajita plate is something I never caught the vision of. My guitar is something that I loved once upon a time. I have nostalgic feelings about, but I don't currently do. And the weight set is and has always be, been the thing I'll get to tomorrow, Right? The thing that I, you have intentions, but mostly just guilty feelings that I just never do, okay? But there's a fourth present that I wanna tell you about. And that is one Christmas, my mom bought me a fishing pole, okay? Well, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Brian. So I, uh, I didn't ask for this one. This one shocked me. Uh, this one, I'm in my, in my 20s. I was studying in seminary down in Pasadena. And uh, this year at Christmas, she, she got me a, a fishing pole. My initial response was, uh, well, that's kind of random. I don't, Mom, I don't, I don't fish, <laughs> right? I, I, haven't, I haven't tried fishing in 20 years, you know, since I went with her as a kid. And I'd never even caught a fish in my whole life before. Like, why are you getting me a fishing pole? And she said, yeah, but... You've always loved sitting places and pondering since you were a little kid. You just like to sit and ponder. You also love nature. So I thought what you could do is you could sit in nature and ponder with a fishing pole. I was like, oh, okay, right? I take it home. I kind of set, set it in my room. And, you know, I just every once in a while I look at it. And then I thought to myself, well, if I own a fishing pole... I might, I might as well like learn how to fish. I learn how to use this thing. So I, I, I did some internet research on how to fish, right? I, uh, I went to a store, a tackle store where you can kind of get some advice from people. I went to a couple of workshops. I, I got a book. I just, I just sort of taught myself how to fish. And I started, you know, going to like a lake and, 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 and you know, throwing a hook in the water. And I tell you, the first time I caught a fish, I was hooked. I know, so lame, huh? So, so lame. But uh, no, I, I, I did. I, as soon as I, I caught a fish, I'm like, whoa, this is, this is cool. This is fun. This is interesting. Being by the lake, it's peaceful. I feel somehow kind of connected to nature in this way by, by messing with a fish. I'm not really sure how it connects. But, but I, I loved it. It became like a great source of, of, of peace and, and joy for me. I'm gonna show you a, a picture of me. Um, this is me at Lake Tahoe catching a 300 pound rainbow trout, okay? See, I even learned how to lie like a fisherman, okay? Um, it, it became a great joy, it became my favorite hobby, uh, source of just peace and enjoyment. Um, I ended up catching a ton of fish. I'll show you, this is a picture, I'll show you a picture of a fish I caught in Florida. 
That one's legit. That's a bull red. It's huge. Uh, of course, I'm holding it closer to the camera to make it appear even huger. That's a trick. But uh, caught a lot of fish. And um, I actually um, started teaching other people how to fish. So uh, starting uh, with college students, I, I was um, a pastor for university students at UC Davis for, for many years. And we took a lot of retreats up into the Sierra Nevada with, um, with the college students. And I taught a lot of college students how to fish for the first time. Facilitate a lot of college students catching fish for the first time, taught them how to clean it, how to cook it. Like all of that, I became a fishing evangelist. Okay? This next picture I'll show you is, uh, is uh, that's actually Hannah. Uh, isn't she cute? That's Hannah when she's real little, and she caught that fish all by herself with that princess fishing pole. She, she did it all. She reeled it in. She had like just the, the pride. I mean, she was my, she was my fishing buddy uh, all during those years, and um, that's a good, that's a good, good fish. So, like, like, you put all this together, and uh, I have a super different relationship with this gift that I received than with the other gifts, right? This one has actually become integrated with part of my life. I receive so much of the joy from using it, and I actually am so excited about it that I teach other people how to do it. I wanna introduce other people to the joy that I have found there. I don't remember the fajita plate. I mean, I don't even ever remember opening the box. Warm, nostalgic feelings about the guitar. Guilty feelings about the weights that I never have gotten to yet. Uh, but the fishing pole is part of my life. Why am I telling you all this? Jesus tells us a parable. We call the parable of the sower or the parable of the four soils. And I want to lay alongside the parable Jesus told alongside the parable that I have just told you to see what we can learn together. So the parable of the sower, that means a farmer, uh, someone who raises crops for a living. And in particular, a sower is someone that, that farms by a certain method. They have a bag that's sort of tied around their waist that holds the grain that they wanna plant. And it's full of some kind of a, some kind of a grain or of a seed that's something they could eat. It's, it's, it's a good thing they could feed their families with it, but instead they believe in the miracle of multiplication. It's really the foundation of, of our lives and economy is the fact that you could put a good thing into the ground and it could grow up to be a bigger and better thing. And the sower has this around their waist and, and just takes a handful of at a time and just kind of sifts it out and sprinkles it around the dirt in hopes that it would grow. But there's wind and there's kind of uneven land and it just ends up finding different receptions in different kinds of lands, four in particular. And I'll walk you through it. The same seed, the same sower, the same hopefulness, but they find a different reception. Soil number one is the path. Jesus says, uh, then he told him many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Now this is uh, 2,000 years ago. There's not a paved cement path. This is like the hard packed dirt of a walking trail along the border of the field. It's kind of packed densely. And, and so it's, 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 it's hard ground, and the seed just kind of doesn't pierce it. It just kind of rests on top. It says it's easy prey for the birds. The seed never has a chance. The birds just come, and they take it away. And later, Jesus is asked to explain it. And so I'll, I'll skip to the explanation there in verse 18. It says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So he doesn't necessarily define the sower here. He defines the seed. And the seed is the message about the kingdom. 
Okay, that's what we're trying to study. That's what we're doing in these 14 weeks together. That's what all these graphics are about. We're trying to understand what is the message of the kingdom. And right now we have a parable that's telling us the seed represents that thing which we are studying. The seed is the message about the kingdom of God. The sower could be God. It could be, it could be Jesus who in that moment is teaching them. It could be the disciples later that get sent out to preach. They become sowers. It could be us. The seed is always the message about the kingdom. And the path represents a certain reception it gets in people's hearts. Maybe their hearts are hard packed. They're hardened and it just kind of stays up on the top. They never quite get it, and then it just kind of is taken away. Their relationship, these people's relationship to the gospel is like my relationship to the fajita plate. I I don't get it. It's confusing. I, I just don't grasp the vision of it. I've never really opened it and tried it out. I just sort of, someone handed it to me and I, and I kind of held it at a distance and at some point it just sort of disappeared from my life and Jesus is telling us, that's like the path, right? People who they just don't quite get the gospel, they don't understand it or they have a hard heart, they don't receive it. And he tells us in particular, the birds are like Satan, like the evil one who comes and snatches it away before it can ever take root. Now, it might sound strange for some of you to hear us talking about Satan. You're like, Satan, the devil? You mean the guy with the tail and the red horns and the pitchfork? Uh, None of that description is in in the Bible, okay? But but, uh, but for Jesus, Satan is very much real. And so, because he believes it, I believe it, that there is an evil spirit, an evil adversary of God that does not want us to know God or to receive the message of the gospel. And he's at work in the world, keeping us from hearing it. And that's like the birds. Well, I don't wanna be the path. We don't wanna be the path. We don't wanna have a fajita plate kind of reception of the gospel where we just don't get it and we just sort of let it pass out of our lives as though it's not worth much. Then there's the rocky soil. Some fell on rocky places, Jesus said, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. In Israel, there is a lot of limestone and the limestone can be rocks on top or it can just be kind of right under the surface or it can be deep down below and you don't always know. So there can be farmland that looks all the same but some of it has deep soil and some of it's really thin over a layer of limestone. And he's describing that some seed hits that and and it it grows at first, right? It has a a burst of growth, but the the, the roots just are not, the rocks keep the the dirt from being, or keep the roots from being able to go deep. And, and, And because of that, they can't grow the kind of kind of nourishment that they need. They can't tap into the moisture that they're gonna need to sustain them through adversity, through the scorching heat of summer. Jesus explains this in verse 20. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no roots, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So Jesus is telling us the rocky soil is like someone who hears the gospel and they're like, yes, this is great. I love this and I want to worship and how do I get involved? And and there's this initial kind of burst of enthusiasm. But because of something in the, the, something just prevents them from developing roots. And so adversity comes and it just knocks their momentum and they just kind of just can't sustain themselves through that. That's like my relationship with my guitar. Okay, I received it with absolute joy. And I was like, this is great. And I, and I played it, right? And I, and I loved it. I was growing, but I just hit a little adversity. My, my, I, ha- I had the bump in the road of my finger and I was delayed for several months in playing it. And I just never got back at it. I wonder if there's anyone in this room today that could identify with the rocky soil. Was there a time in your life, sometime in the past, 
when you felt alive to Jesus, you felt excited about your faith, you felt like, uh, you felt a burst of enthusiasm about the gospel, but then something happened and it knocked you off track and you've just kind of never been the same. So your faith is something more like nostalgia than an active, breathing faith now. I think something that um, sometimes this happens in our life because uh, we're, we're sort of done a disservice if when someone explains us to the gospel, they sort of tell it to us kind of like what we call the prosperity gospel. We, this expectation that if you become a Christian, your life is now gonna be peaches and cream. And the reality Jesus braces us for is that actually sometimes being a Christian might make your life harder. And so we need to not be surprised by adversity. And hopefully we become able to put down the kind of roots that can sustain us through those hard times. We don't want to be rocks. We want to be rooted. The third one is this. Jesus says, other seeds fall among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Now it's not like hard dirt like the path. It's not shallow soil like the rocky soil. This is just soil with competition. The th- that, that, that soil, it has, it has within it rival seeds, which are growing up at the same time. And I don't, has anybody ever gardened before and had problems with weeds? Anybody? There, can't you testify that it's like the stuff you want to grow takes a lot of work, but the weeds just go by themselves. It's unbelievable how much they can outpace the thing we want to grow and they can kind of choke it out. And, and, and so these kind of these thorn bushes compete with the, the seeds of the gospel for, uh, for time. I mean, for, uh, for uh, well, in, the, in the parable, the thorns compete with the, the good seed for uh, light and, uh, and moisture and, and nutrients. And Jesus explains to us the meaning of it uh, in verse 22. He says, The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. This is like my relationship with my weight set, okay? My weight set, I had good intentions. I, I, I wanted to give this time and attention but I had just other things competing for my time and attention, so I just kind of don't get to it, right? And Jesus tells us that the gospel has rivals. The message of the kingdom comes into our lives, and in our lives there are rival seeds which grow up and compete with the gospel for our time and attention, and he names them. He names two things. He tells you, I will tell you what the rival seeds are in your life that are competing with the seeds of the gospel. Are you ready for them? Did you catch it in the scripture? What are the two rival seeds? The first one is the worries of this life. Quick survey, show our hands. How many of you have worries? All right, good. Half of you raised your hand and half of you are lying. (laughs) You're lying. We are all full of worries and fears, right? We, We have fear and anxiety about money, success, health, relationships. And Jesus says those fears are rival seeds, rival plants, which can choke out the gospel from our lives. Jesus, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying because I'm so busy listening to my fears. So I can't hear the good news of the kingdom. The second rival seed that Jesus tells us about, he says, the deceitfulness of wealth. It's interesting. It's not deceitfulness in general. It's a very specific deceitfulness. The deceitfulness of wealth is a rival seed. Raise your hand if you own something. Raise your hand if there's something in your mind that you wish you owned. 
Okay, all right, me too. All right, so we are all also subject to the deceitfulness of wealth. Our stuff speaks to us. It's like in one ear we have the worries saying, fear me, worry about me, be anxious about me. And in the other ear we have our stuff or our desired stuff speaking to us saying, chase me, pursue me, lust after me, want me, right? And these are voices in our ears all the time. Our worries and our desires for more things and they are rival seeds, they are thorn bushes that keep us from hearing the good news of the kingdom. And the more we listen to our fears, the more we listen to the deceitfulness of wealth, the less the gospel of the kingdom can flourish within us. I don't want to be the thorny ground. I want to be the good soil. And thank God for the fourth soil. Jesus says this. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the reason the farmer sows the seeds. If it wasn't for the fourth soil, nobody would eat. The fourth soil is the foundation of our nutrition. Every good meal you ever ate started in the fourth soil. The foundation of our lives and of our economy is the multiplication of seeds in good soil. One seed becomes 30, 60, or 100 seeds. He explains this. He says, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word, who hears the message about the kingdom, and understands it and grasps it and receives it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. This is what we're going for, right? This is the message of the kingdom coming into us and becoming the loudest voice in our lives, becoming the thing that unchains us, that rescues us, that redefines our life, that comes in and gives us hope And it replaces our anger and our rage with the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That these things well up within us. It's like my relationship to my fishing pole. It became a part of my life. I discovered the joy of fishing and I was so pumped about it. I just naturally wanted to tell other people. This fishing pole impacted my life in a way these other things didn't. And the gospel can do that in your life. There can be actual real fruit in which you are changed. Your life is profoundly changed. But it looks something like this symbol here. It looks something like, this is what we can see. This is the the heart is the crop. That's that's what we're going for. That's That's the visible fruit of a life transformed that's alive to God and is just kind of open in loving embrace to the world. But, but in order to grow this kind of heart, we need deep roots. And we need ground cleared of, of rocks and cleared of thorns and, and a, a soft reception. So, so this is the depiction of that where we grow our deep roots that can sustain us through adverse times that can shout to us louder than the rival voices in our lives, and it bears the life in Christ that we want. Now, what do we do with all this, just to conclude our study? What do we, what do we do? Some people read this passage, and it's just fatalistic. It's like, well, you're either good soil, or you're bad soil, and so sucks for you if you're bad soil, Right? <laughs> A lot of us read it and we feel, we feel full of guilt. We're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not the good soil. I'm pretty rocky, I'm pretty thorny. Uh, what, I don't know what to do with this passage, but I'll, I'll just tell you how it, how it intersects with my own life. In my life, uh, as I read this scripture, I'm a different soil depending on the day. There are days in which I am the path. And I, may, I try to read the Bible, I try to open up the Bible and I'm just like, oh, phew. Oh, I don't know, whatever. I, I can't, I can't do this today. And, and, and there's days in which I'm the path. 
and when Satan just messes with me, right? There's other days in, in, in which I'm, um, you know, more like uh, the burst, but I hit adversity and I, and I get derailed. There's, there's other uh, times in which I'm totally, totally distracted by my other concerns in which I am the thorny ground. But there's days in which I'm the good soil. There's days in which I feel God speaking to me and I feel myself being changed, depending on the day. Now, in my own research on my own self and my own life, I have discovered so far one main thing that depends on which soil I am that day, okay? And I just, that's why I said, I'm not gonna go through this with you again, but I just set this up for you as a reminder for those of you who were in the prayer series with us. If you missed it, I wanna encourage you to go on our website and, uh, and check it. You can, re- you can rewatch those sermons. They're all posted, particularly the first one. I introduced you to a prayer practice that I do. And I, it's, it's my stillness practice. And I, this is my setup that I use in my office. And I have a prayer journal. And uh, we gave this away in the prayer series. We gave away prayer journals uh, along with this bookmark that gives you guidance on if, if you're just starting off in prayer journaling, here's what I do and what works for me and you can experiment with it. If you missed that prayer series, uh, if you never got your journal, we have extras of these in the back at the Welcome Center and it's our free gift to you today. We wanna encourage you, to, you can take a journal, you can take a bookmark and maybe it can be a beginning for you of this practice. What I have found is that on the days in which I skip this, I tend to be the rocks and the thorns. And when something adversity happens or somebody's mad at me or they send me an angry email or whatever, ah, I feel all, you know, whatever, flying feelings within me, okay? As you all do too, okay? Uh, When I've sat with God and I've prayed and I've journaled and I've reflected and I've just tried to kind of till the soil in my heart, I feel God doing something different in me and those are the days in which I'm at my best and I'm actually able to respond to whatever I encounter with more love and grace. Okay, those are the days in which I've tilled the soil of my heart and I, and I, and I look more like what I'm, what I'm going for. So I just wanna commend to you to reflect this week and just think about what soil you wanna be and think about if there's any ways that you can in your life Prepare the ground for the gospel to go deep within you. Any ways you can quiet down the fear and the deceitfulness of wealth, any ways you can kind of clear out the rocks and develop the kind of roots that will lead to the kind of faith and life that you want. May you be good soil and may you produce a crop 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. I want to invite you to stand uh, right now. And I'm going to offer a benediction. We're going to uh, give you the benediction right now and send you, send you out. May the sower of the seeds sow the message of the kingdom in your hearts. May the, 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 the devil, the evil one, not snatch it from you. May it sink deeply within you. May the spirit that dwells within you quiet down the thorny voices of distraction. May the rocks be cleared. May roots go deep in your life. And may you produce fruit to everyone around you. God bless you.